leads me to the end of love dance me to the end of love Leonard Cohen has died aged 82 he was at the forefront of the singer songwriter boom in the 1960s mixing despair and dry humor Known for dark lyrics and pared back delivery, Cohen was also a poet and novelist of considerable repute. Here to discuss his life and work is the FT's pop critic, Ludo Hunter Tilney. Ludo, sad, another sad day in a very sad year. It has um, been a bad year, Jan, indeed, for uh, rock music, pop music. Um, it feels as though the pantheon of rock is, is either rapidly emptying, if that's where the living greats abide, or, or filling up, if that's where they go to after they die. Um, I mean, Leonard Cohen's death, he himself said that he was ready to die in an interview with The New Yorker, which was published earlier this year. But then he released a new album only a few weeks ago, You Want It Darker, uh, which is not only extremely good, but at the press conference when it was released, Cohen turned up and said that he had been exaggerating when he said he was ready to die and that he was prone to self-dramatization, he said <laughs> dryly, and that he wanted to live forever. Um, so I feel that uh, the sense of his uh, the death, whilst he ha had clearly been suffering from fragile health while making the album, it comes as a shock due to the fact that he had seemed to recover his spirits. Well, we all know that it was Bob Dylan that got the Nobel Prize for Literature, but in some ways Cohen was just as literary a figure and his lyrics um, played just the, as important a part in his work. Well, if not an even more literary figure because he began as a poet and then um, published his first collection of poetry in 1956 when he was 21 years old and it received great acclaim. He was a sort of golden boy of Canadian writing and then proceeded to publish more well-received volumes of poetry and two novels. Um, uh, so he came to music comparatively late. He was over 30 when he released his debut album. So in that respect, he sort of stood apart from his fellow 60s greats. I mean, he did have this other side, and he didn't look upon any difference between the poems and the songs, many of which drew on the poetry in order for, for, for their lyrics. Well, he, yes, he definitely was of a rather different generation, uh, because, you know, even a couple of years made a lot of difference in the 60s, let alone 10 or more years. So it, and it, I think it, I think he probably did feel like that at the time. I don't actually remember that bit of it. But I think but he sort of, he, I mean, he bridged in a way. He came, he was too late for the Beats, mm. who he got to know, Ginsberg. He, he mm. knew Alexander Trotchy, the Scottish writer. So he, befri he befriended the Beats, but he was too, he was too young to be part mm. of that scene mm. and didn't quite share their very wild sensibility. And he was also younger than the, than the likes of Dylan, who came after that. So he was a slightly in-between place. And he was also, of course, Canadian, which gave him another sense mm. of being an outsider. And further beyond that, he was, of course, Jewish, which gave him yet another sense of being an outsider, which was very strong, I think, in part, although he grew up in a wealthy family, he did have the sense of being someone who was slightly outside of things, a sort of a, a, an observer, if you like, a sort of a, a, a wanderer in, in, in many ways. So when it all began with the first, it was called Songs of Leonard Cohen, wasn't it, the first? Mm. Um, album. Um, was it a slow start for him or did it go no, off like it, a rocket? It didn't go off quite like a rocket but it sold over 100,000 copies which was a respectable amount, not spectacular but certainly respectable and it established him as a singer-songwriter among the, I mean it was coming towards the end of the folk revival, it was 67. Um, uh, Simon and Garfunkel, of course, were sort of making it very big, so there was still a lot of um, popularity attached to it, but it was just, you know, things like Sgt Pepper were happening as well, and the Dylan had obviously gone electric. So he did establish a name for himself. He became a sort of cult figure, I would say, at that point, someone who the sort of uh, more literary, possibly the more sort of uh, deep and anguished of the teenage listeners might gravitate to. Our viewers are um, coming in with some real... Um, a real sense of loss here. Matthew Pocock comments, 2016 is being totally brutal. What more will this year take away from us? Well, there's not long to go, but... And Salvia Salapa says, incredible loss. I mean, a real sense of, sense of mourning there. I think at these times, one has to also concentrate on what, what is left. Uh, and, and I mean, it is, I think, proper also to feel a sense of gratefulness for what these artists, what people such as 
Cohen have left behind them. And I think in his case, that feeling of loss is so magnified by the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, his most recent album, released only a few weeks ago, mm. is so good mm. that you feel that this is an interesting thing, I think, with musicians who are able to keep operating until very late on in their lives. I mean, making an album is a sort of collaborative process in a studio. They're able to make these very powerful statements at an advanced stage when their health might not be so good. And so we're left with a very strong sense of them as artistic presences. Mm. Well, yes, talking about the collaboration, I mean, latterly, he he Cohen was surrounded by this rock solid band wasn't he and had rather extraordinary relationships with um i mean i i didn't really understand that the 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 female singers in the band who look as if they are kind of pretty ordinary backing singers were far more than that real deep collaborators particularly Sharon Robinson who he'd worked with for more than 35 years and who wrote music and it was an important important kind of thing yeah I think one of my favorite aspects of his um, music is the role of women in it because throughout his career from the very beginning of it he would have female singers whose voices would entwine with his and they would be acting variously as a sort of consolation. They would also be a sort of uh, focus for erotic energy. They had all manner of sort of roles, and you feel that this was a really important sort of aspect of, uh, of, of his work, not just in the sense of, of the ladies' man that he sent up himself with the mm. you know, album called The Death of, of, a, of a Ladies' Man, but in a much deeper sense of this idea of men and women and how they relate and the sort of dance of attraction and also of repulsion that they... Uh, engage in during the course of a life. Many of the lyrics are quite, um, I mean, they, they, they're quite complicated, aren't they? I mean, there's no such thing as a straightforward Cohen love song, is there? No. <laughs> always got a real sting in the tail. Um, yes, there's always a sting in the tail. It's told in a wonderfully shifting way, both very certain, you're certain that each word has been thought about. He found writing actually sort of quite hard. Mm. Um, it wasn't something which he said came very easily to him. Uh, and you sense that there's been an immense thought put in the position of each word and where it should be. Yet uh, he has a way of undercutting himself, like that famous line, I have tried in my way. Yeah. I mean, it's the in my way there, which gives this line, this wonderful ambiguity, because one doesn't really know what sort of a way. In the sense of a sort of unreliable narrator, which is underneath the great precision with which the words are delivered to one. It's a very, it's a part of the magnificent opacity which he managed to bring to his writing. Mm. And um, yet his, I mean, another great sadness in 2016 was the death of Marianne, his long time uh, lover um, and partner. And the letter that he wrote to her was extremely moving, wasn't it? And of course, to some extent, was yet another of his predictions about his own death. He said, I'm effectively, I'm right behind you. But he also, it also evoked something else which I think is, you know, always lies somehow behind his, his, his many of his, his songs, which is um, quite a deep sense of religion and spirituality. Mm. And there's, there's a lot, there's a lot there in the life, isn't there? Uh, there is, and I think just actually thinking about what you say, one thing which also comes to mind there is, is, is the sense of companionship which mm. I think runs through his, his music, both the wish for companionship and, mm. and then the offering of companionship too. And I think that has the, a religious mm. side as well, where his search for some sort of solace has ta takes a number of different directions. They can both be sort of, as it were, carnal, they can be sensual, and they are very importantly spiritual. I mean, he, 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 he never left the uh, Judaism in which he was brought up. He was part of a very prominent Jewish family in Montreal. His grandfather was the president of the synagogue. Um, and this never left him, but at the same time he searched around. He went, and he, 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 he went to a Buddhist retreat for five years. I thought he beca actually became a Buddhist. Well, he became a Buddhist in terms of, I mean, he became a Buddhist, yes, but he became a Buddhist in the loosest sense, if you like, which in a way in which I, be I, I believe that the religion allows. <laughs> which is allows, pretty loose, I think. Which is pretty loose. I think he had, I mean, he had this sense of wanting to be, of wanting to find some sort of religious answer, but not being able to find it in any one particular faith mm. or, um, or area. And so it would look sort of around. Mm. Well, um, the the sense of an afterlife was there, wasn't it? I mean, it, it in what he wrote to Marianne, it did sound as if he had a belief in the afterlife. Um, 
Yes, which, I think that, that and um, mm. I, I think that's, that's right. I mean, I was um, very struck with the last words of his latest album, which is in which he says that I, I wish there was a treaty between my love and yours. It's unclear what this love is. Earlier he talks about wine and water. I mean, I would read it as, as being almost a sort of Judaism on the one hand and Christianity, having grown up in a Catholic city, Montreal. Mm. Um, and his very first book of poetry, well, no, well his very first book of poetry was uh, about um, uh, comparing um, mythologies oh. and talking mm. about my mythology and your mythology. And mm. I think that this idea of, of, of uh, trying to find some truth in these different shifting mm. masses was uh, very much there. Yes, well, um, certainly a, a, a very, very kind of powerful sense of, of, of um, seeking for something, as you say. Um, so he was a great collaborator with women in music, and you've talked about the companionship and everything else, and how he joked about being a ladies' man, but he was kind of also famous for a sort of love him and leave him attitude, but I suppose no more than any other um, rock or pop idol of the time. <laughs> well, yes. Um, I, I think it's, I mean, it seems that he did have a sort of a slightly Casanova, certainly in his younger years, that's definitely mm. true. I think that the women whom he was with all seem to be very fond of him and loyal to him. I mean, this sort of, um, and obviously he conducted himself throughout his life with the most immense charm and, and a sort of uh, courtesy, courtly, courtly, courtliness, oh, really, mm -hmm. of um, very great sense of chivalry. Oh, well, that's very nice. Because the, um, the other um, important relationship was, was with uh, Suzanne, who was the mother of his two children. Although she's not actually the Suzanne of the song, is that right? No, the Suzanne oh. of the song, in fact, is another Suzanne with whom he had no physical relationship. Hence, in the song, the lyric about touching your perfect body with my mind, it was mm -hmm. she was the wife of a friend of his oh. with whom he had a, a, a sort of a, a meaningful evening in, the, uh, in her flat by the, in a sort of slightly derelict area of Montreal. Um, and um, no, in that, so this, that was about a sort of meeting, a meeting of minds. Mm. Well, that's also, I mean, a, a sort of te almost teasing, isn't I it? Think the one thing about teasing. And I think one th yes. I do think one thing about him which, which comes across strongly is this sense that in our age, someone who does try so seriously to try and sort of find the answer which lies beneath things is, um, is very attractive. It's, 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 it's a trait which I feel we feel is somehow slipping away. Mm -hmm. He said that he took from uh, his, one of his great poetic uh, influences was Lorca, the Spanish poet. Mm -hmm. And he said that he learnt from him that one must never, one must always lament seriously. Oh, that's and a very nice thing. And I think the sense that he pursued these with both good, with a humour, with a wit, a black comedy, and a great sense of irony, but also always that seriousness, that nub of seriousness, mm. is something which I feel that generally we sense slipping away from our popular culture and our culture at large, and that Cohen was someone who epitomised that. And in that respect, I think, provides a sort of example that we can sort of hope mm. to live up to ourselves. And in that respect, you could say that his passing does then provide us with some sort of standard by which we should take ourselves forward. Well that's a very wonderful sentiment, perhaps one on which we'll close this and thank you so much Ludo. Thank you Jan. <laughs> if you want a lover, I'll do anything that you ask me to. If you want to try another kind of love, I'll wear an old man's mask for you. If you want a partner, take my hand Or if you want to strike me down in anger Here I stand I'm your man